There's only a handful of games left in Skybet League One. Let's break down all of the intricate details that you might have missed. Let's go. As always, if you do find value from the content, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. Less than 2,000 subscribers until, dare I say it, the 10K mark. If you're not subscribed, please do. It helps me out more than you can imagine. Let's begin with the first game at the Valley as they hosted Barnsley. It finishes Charlton 2, Barnsley 1, the XG, or non-penalty XG, I should say, 1.08 to 1.60. The XG tells us how open this game was at times, and it made for quite a fascinating encounter. Let's begin with Charlton. Give Nathan Jones the keys, trust his methods, and next season could be one to remember. That's my direct message to you Charlton supporters. There's a long way from being perfection at this stage, of course, but with so many ideas being implemented already, ready it's very exciting and I can feel the excitement from the Charlton supporters online it was Charlton's best display this season in the words of Jones himself it was front-footed it was positively aggressive and it was more like his team the addicts have now secured safety their unbeaten run extends to 11 which is their longest unbeaten run in five years it's only a building block only a start but it does feel like a really important one as for Barnsley, it was only their second defeat on the road this season. And the unrest around Neil Collins and the way they're playing games, it does continue. Externally, the league position is fine, but momentum going into the playoffs is so important. A clunky attack, a disjointed, patchy defensive record. It's not the ideal way to finish a regular season with still so much to play for. Talking of momentum, let's talk about the graph. It shows a game that has no consistent control, maybe slightly after Barnsley these goal but for large periods of the game it was won and lost in transition and of course a spectacular free kick from Alfie May. I love what Nathan Jones says after games he gives us so much honesty so much insight and it makes my job a little bit easier here on a Sunday afternoon talking about Charles Athletic with him in charge. Throughout his career, he's spoken about positive aggression and front-footed intentions. And for the first time over a 90-minute period, I think we saw Charlton do that. It's never been intricate. It's never been indirect. Instead, it's about total protection of their own box and then often being quite direct to a hard-working striker who should then quickly have bodies around him in support. And that's where Alfie May comes into play. Charlton attempted 92 long balls yesterday, the most out of every League One club competing this weekend. That means from their 305 attempted parties in total, 30% of those were long balls. Alfie May is more than just his goals. He plays a pivotal role in this Nathan Jones team. His personal heat map shows the sheer amount of work he does away from the penalty box. His work rate is relentless. He's not just a penalty box striker. He's not just a brilliant finisher, but he's also a hard-working attacker in quite a brutal system, especially for the centre forwards. Alfie May currently sits in the top 4% for possession one back in the final third and the top 3% for recoveries in comparison to all other League One centre forwards. Nathan Jones was asked, after the game about Alfie May's role and was it as simple as just letting May do his thing? And he said quite bluntly, no, he still needs to carry on his work out of possession. If you compare a heat map from last season for Cheltenham and his heat map from yesterday, the difference in work rate is fascinating. He's moved away from being just a poacher kind of striker at this level and has transitioned into being quite aggressive in his pressing style. He's also the league top goal scorer, so he's doing pretty well on that front and sits in the top 10% for non-penalty shots per 90. So maybe he's just very complete. Barnsley played the percentages in front of goal yesterday afternoon at the Valley and you have to say that didn't quite work. When you play the low percentages in shots on goal, you have to play the high percentages in conversion and a 0% open play conversion isn't going to cut it. The chances weren't bad either. Devante Cole missed two huge opportunities with a combined XG of 1.05 and of course they did have a penalty in which they did convert. Devante Cole actually sits fourth for most big chances missed this season. If all of those big chances were converted, the metrics suggest he should have 32 goals this season. It's the wasteful finishing in front of goal that's filling some Barnsley fans with some nerves as the season does reach its climax. Burton nil, Oxford United 4 was the final score. XG was 0.48 to 2.98. In some cases, the stats can be misleading. Not this time. The expected goals and the scoreline 
does paint the same picture. Let's start with Burton first. There are so many reasons why you should be concerned about Burton Albion, especially if you are a Burton Albion supporter. I'm concerned and I'm not a Burton Albion supporter. The direction that they're heading under Martin Patterson's management is extremely concerning. I'm sorry, they looked dreadful yesterday. We'll delve into the details later, but the tactical naivety was an example of footballing suicide. They failed to do their homework and approach the game with total confusion from back to front. That heavy defeat does see them drop into the bottom four, losing seven straight home league games. As for Oxford, it was a professional, ruthless and quite scintillating display. And at this stage in the season, we can sometimes become obsessed with results, but the confidence from good performances cannot be overlooked. Back-to-back 4-0 -back wins, fantastic defending in and around the penalty box, clear attacking patterns being converted into goals. Oxford are looking to finish this season strong. Oh, and they are inside the top six. Did I mention that? Didn't I should mention that. It feels important. Let's talk about the graph in front of you now. Oxford's biggest issue since Des Buckingham arrived was their failure to kill games off when in front. The away side spell after half time was an example of Oxford learning their lessons. It was urgent, it wasn't panicked, it was devastating, and it killed any chance of a nervous finish. Patterson, for me, got this game so wrong. If they'd done their homework on Oxford, he would have known you cannot allow Oxford any joy in behind. Take a look at these screenshots. The top left is Burton's defensive organisation from their own throw just 23 minutes into the game. Of course, that did result in Oxford's first goal. With no support around Bowler, one mistake, and Oxford had three players in on goal. They didn't learn their lesson because the next three goals are almost identical, a pass through the back line and a foot race led by some of the quickest attacking players in the league. Burton's high line and advanced wing backs were one of the worst tactical blunders I've seen this season. And we've seen quite a few, but it was horrendous. Oxford couldn't believe their luck. Des would have been rubbing his hands at halftime. These average positions show just how high Burton played, leaving so much space for Harris, Murphy, Dell and Goodrum to run into. If you're going to operate with a high line, you need great pace or a comfortable ability on the ball at the back. And let's be honest, Burton have neither. The home side were second best all afternoon. And as shown by the diagram brought to you by the analyst, it's been happening all season. This shows where a side is touching the ball in open play. The red is where the opposition has over 55% of touches, the grey is contested, and the blue is their own. It's clear in the attacking and the midfield zones, Burton, they have no control. It's often quite direct with very little result. There's even a space in their own box where the opposition are contesting touches of the ball. It highlights in one photo, the issues that Burton are having. And speaking of touches inside the box, Mark Harris had plenty. He finished the game with three goal contributions, two goals and one assist, touching the ball the most inside Burton's box. Along with his 50% conversion rate, he created six chances and finished the game with a combined expected goals and assist metric of 1.94. At Fratton Park, it finishes Portsmouth 3, Shrewsbury 1, the non-penalty XG 0.73 to 0.85. Initially, the XG is very interesting. You just don't normally see Pompey's open play expected goals being that low. Let's begin with the home side. It felt like a tactical game of chess at times. It required patience. It required Pompey holding their nerve. But it also required Pompey to take full advantage of split second moments. And like we've said so many times this season, that's exactly what they did to win this game. Pompey fans won't and shouldn't care, but at times it felt quite passive and lackadaisical in build-up. And we'll actually credit Shrewsbury for this later. But I'll also switch that negative into a positive from a Portsmouth point of view and say, well, when things aren't working, we'll just change our weapon. And quite frankly, that's what champions do. We'll use the phrase one step closer. We've said it a few times over the past few weeks, but Portsmouth now are very literally one win away from the championship. Exciting. Exciting times indeed. Shrewsbury should be praised for their approach. It was heavily focused on compact organisation and frustrating Portsmouth. And you'd say for large spells of the match, that worked and they did find some joy. I thought they got unlucky with the penalty. For me, it's just not a penalty. And if it's not given, the game goes, I think, in a very different direction because at that moment and even during the second half, their game plan and execution was working brilliantly. 
And of course, if it's still on level terms, they don't have to chase the game and commit as many bodies forward. Feeling hard done by when walking away from Fratton Park won't feel great now, but I think what it does tell us is Shrewsbury, they weren't there to be pushed over and they made this a real challenge at times. As you can see by the graph in front of you, Pompey's control is clear, but there were issues in creation and in build-up. There's a real struggle to break the Shrewsbury team down. It took 20 minutes for Shrewsbury to settle in the game and they had to ride some early Pompey waves. They did concede during that time, but after that you trusted their work out of possession as they pretty much squandered every open play move effectively. If we're looking to compare the ways Paul Hurst approached this game to the way that Matt Taylor approached things last time Shrewsbury played Pompey, the graphs look so different. Pompey's dream rhythm was disrupted so often yesterday, unlike the match in which they were away back in December where they just really allowed Pompey to control every aspect of the match. Shrewsbury were comfortable with Pompey having the majority of the ball. They conceded 66% possession, only allowed three open play shots on target against them, and an open play XG against of just 0.73 was conceded. You admire Pompey's patience and adventurous work to find different ways of hurting the away side in the end, but for long spells you have to praise the opposition's game plan. The away side forced Messino's men to play with a slower tempo for the most part. They only completed five key passes during the match and only 15% of their total passes were into the final third. Take a look at the average positions in front of you. They show us how low of a low block it was. They set up very, very compact as they essentially said, come on then, break us down. The centre of the pitch is extremely compact, with the wing-backs looking to stop the threats of Paddy Lane and Abu Kamara in the wide areas. Elliot Bennett tucked in to almost operate as a fourth midfielder, suffocating the areas in which Pompey wanted to attack. This is a screenshot from the match yesterday afternoon, and often there's a misconception that sides that play in a low block offer no threat inside the area, but this screenshot would suggest otherwise. This is Shrewsbury's equalising goal and demonstrates their intentions to flood the opposition box at the right time. It's all about timing, but you can see Shrewsbury, they had bodies in and around the box, and in this case, it led to a goal. Now this image is from the second half and again shows the compact organisation of the away side but just moments after the screenshot was taken, Shrewsbury capitalised on a poor back pass and they had a fantastic opportunity to level the game. A great save from Will Norris. The travelling side had more touches inside the opposition box than the opposition, only conceding 14 Portsmouth touches. Pompey don't get out-touched very often. I'm not quite sure we're going to keep that. We're going to keep it in. Out-touched. Different phrase. Currently ranking second for the most touches inside the opposition box so far this season. Bishop and Yengi's partnership is intriguing and it offered just another way that Pompey could hurt an opposition. Take a look at their positioning. Bishop operated as the deepest Portsmouth attacker using his under the radar link up play ability effectively. Colby completed three passes into the final third. Only Paddy Lane completed more from Pompey's attack. Kamara and Lane switched flanks, but their luck didn't change. They only completed a combined six successful dribbles, with Kamara not even touching the ball once inside the Shrewsbury box. The Bishop and Yenge partnership, in my opinion, is all about balance. You've got the technical work of Bishop dropping deeper and the raw pace of Yenge in behind and his ability to take on players with his fantastic work on the ball. This is a clever tactical experiment that is just another weapon that Pompey can use and that's like I said in the introduction why they will be champions because they have so many different ways of hurting a team. If that doesn't work they can change, if that doesn't work they can try something different. Sadie came on and made a great impact in at number 10 and maybe this Yengi and Bishop thing is just a short term option maybe it's a long-term option it doesn't really matter ultimately in this game it did work at times you fix a leak Pompey find a new hole you fix that leak they'll find somewhere else to hurt the opposition it's what the best sides do Around the grounds we go, Blackpool 1, Cambridge United 0, Bristol Rovers 0, Bolton 2, Burton 0, Oxford United 4, Charlton 2, Barnsley 1, Exeter 1, Stevenage 0, Leighton Orient 3, Cheltenham 1, Northampton relegate Carlisle, the first team relegated into League 2, commiserations to Carlisle United, they lose 2-0 and are relegated to League 2. Portsmouth 3, Shrewsbury 1, Reading 1, Lincoln 1, and Wigan 0, Port Vale 0. If you did enjoy this episode of The Roundup, please make sure you leave a like and subscribe. Until next time, I'll see you next week for another episode. See you later.